native people, native culture, native knowledge. Hi, I'm Jeannie Green, bringing you award-winning Heartbeat Alaska. Bringing you national and international native news, this is award-winning Heartbeat Alaska, the premier native voice in native programming. There's a heartbeat loud as thunder Revolution is in the air There's a heartbeat deep inside our mother Are you too cool to care? Now, with Heartbeat Alaska, here's Jeannie Green. Hello and welcome to Heartbeat Alaska Native News, Native Information. I'm Jeannie Green. Thank you so very much for joining us. On today's program, we bring you part three of Kayaks and Canoes, Native Ways of Knowing, the conclusion of an incredible documentary. Thank you, Alaska Native Heritage Center, for presenting it to Heartbeat Alaska to air for our viewers. And speaking of Alaska Native Heritage Center, we visit there today with the King Island Dancers and director, Margaret Nelson. I'll be back with Heartbeat Alaska right after this. To people who are watching Heartbeat Alaska, keep on dancing and keep your culture up. That's a native way of saying thank you. This is gonna be a 20 foot red cedar dugout canoe, probably Haida style, but being carved by a clinket. It's a great opportunity, awesome. You get to pretty much go back in time and see what they used to do. By the Nature Conservancy of Alaska, working with Alaska's rural communities to conserve and protect our natural heritage. The gift of past experiences handed down. There are no greater lessons. Support for this program provided by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alaska. We've been giving Alaskans the support they need since before Alaska was even a state. And we'll be here when you need us. We're here. We're with you. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alaska. This program is sponsored in part by Phillips Alaska. Dreamers who make it happen. Harpy Alaska has had the pleasure of bringing you kayaks and canoes, native ways of knowing, an incredibly beautiful documentary that depicts the traditional watercraft building through different cultures. Today we bring you the conclusion. It's a wonderful, wonderful documentary. And thank you once again, Alaska Native Heritage Center. Almost all men in traditional Iyak, Tlingit, Haida, and Simsian cultures were carvers by necessity, but only a few men had the special skills necessary to construct a canoe. The people of southeast Alaska relied heavily on the dugout canoe. The Iyak, Tlingit, Haida, and Simsian peoples preferred canoes carved from the giant red cedar. The dugout canoe was used to transport people and goods for hunting and gathering, to display wealth, and for warfare. They ranged from 10 to 70 feet long. We never wish to offend anybody or any living thing. And if we do, we wish it to be like these feathers, to gently fall on them. <laughs> The native people of Alaska have a profound respect for all living things. Before cutting down a tree to be used for a dugout canoe, the Tlingit people thank the Asquani, or tree people, for their sacrifice. Cook. This ceremony was reenacted in Sitka for educational purposes. going to be a 20-foot red cedar dugout canoe, probably Haida style, but being carved by a clinket. It's a great opportunity, awesome. 
you get to pretty much go back in time and see what they used to do. I'm working with this model. It was probably done in, carved in 1880. It's probably the best uh, example or set of blueprints that I could have for doing one today. And a lot of the elders that knew how to do the canoes in my area are all gone now. I just hope I have a great summer and learn a lot. It takes about three to five months to carve a canoe. Oh, it's not a war canoe. <laughs> it's more like the one you went out to go to Fred Myers with. Ah. Wayne <laughs> Price, a Clinkett master carver, is making a Haida style dugout canoe. Love my job! Love my job! He is working with a 17 year old apprentice, Vanessa Pazar. in honor of the old ones that have all come before me and in respect for the young ones that are still coming up. We're like that medium in between, you know. It's our ability to take a tree and turning it into a canoe from uh, 6,000 pounds down to 200 pounds in three months. That uh, uh, there's something there that should be kept alive. All the while that I'm working, I feel the ancestors watching over me. It's beautiful. When you look at the shape of it, and it's just, I don't know, it speaks to you kind of. The curves on it, it's just, it's turning into a canoe. It's not a log anymore. Whenever I work with wood, I just get a sense of peace. I want to make it nice enough, traditional enough, that kids can come by and look at that and say, wow, that was a tree. It's a labor of love. We're eating, sleeping, and living this log. She's a very big part of our lives. The main tool used to shape the canoe is the ads. The ads pattern created is unique to the carver. Adding doesn't come right away. It's a learned process. After shaping the outside of the log, the carver rolls the canoe over and hollows out the inside. Traditionally, the wood inside the hull might be burned out. Wayne removed most of the wood using an adze and chainsaw, making planks that were used to make seats and paddles. Piece of cake. An ingenious method is used to ensure that the carver maintains the correct thickness and symmetry when hollowing out the log. Holes were drilled from the gunwales down to the key lines along the length of the canoe. These holes, which represent the exact dimension of the width of the gunwales, are filled with small dowels or pegs. When the carver reaches the peg with his adze, he knows that he has completed hollowing out that part of the inside of the canoe. Wayne gets very excited Yay! when he knows he's done chopping out some part of the inside of the hull. Another one. After the bulk of the hull has been removed, the insides are carefully shaped. No log is perfect. Knots in the log must be carefully removed and patched. So it's touching all the way around now. So that's a good thing. When possible, Wayne patched his canoe with wood removed earlier from the same log. The wood grain in the patch must match the direction of the grain on the canoe. Hey! After the patches are in place, the canoe will be steamed to make it larger and form That's its it. final shape. Be quick. It's in there. The canoe was moved to the Denina Athabascan community of Iklutna to be near seawater for the steaming process. The carvers and the Alaska Native Heritage Center wish to thank the people of Iklutna for hosting this event. We're trying to bring the new life back into a log that I had 84 days ago. The heart of the tree will come back and go back into the log. So that's why we're burning all the chips to uh, put the new life back into a very old log. 
Since many buckets of salt water are used in the process, the canoe must be steamed near the ocean. Mud is used to protect the bottom of the canoe. Red hot lava rocks are placed in the canoe after it has been filled with seawater. The canoe was carved with a concave bottom. The inside of the canoe is steamed to drop and flatten the bottom, raise the bow and stern, and widen the canoe. Steaming changes the basic shape of the canoe, making it more seaworthy and allowing it to safely transport more people. As the lava rocks cool, they are replaced. This is a very tricky process. The carver must not attempt to spread the gunwales too far or the canoe will crack, causing irreparable damage after months of carving. The steaming is a long process. Slowly, the canoe changes and comes back to life. After it is steamed open, the canoe is painted with traditional colors red and black. Seats are lashed into the canoe. Steaming this canoe took an entire day. The bow and stern raised six inches, and the canoe widened eight inches as a result of the steaming. That's the last turn down, right there. There's the padlock. Two types of paddles are made. Some paddles are needed to maneuver the canoe. Others are made to be given away in ceremony. Wayne saved wood removed from the canoe to make these paddles. Traditionally, Southeast Alaskan canoes were sailed using woven mats or thin planks. After contact with Europeans, <laughs> these sails like were replaced this. with canvas. I'm not too sure what's gonna happen. But we're gonna do it. Ugh, Lordy! I really have lots of blue on me. After all eight boats were completed at the Alaska Native Heritage Center, they were blessed and certain boats were given names at a dedication ceremony. And the thing it weighs, that is now the name of that canoe. The boats were launched in Homer, Alaska, Labor Day weekend 2000. Some of the elders who shared their knowledge of the boat building process had not paddled a kayak for over 50 years. Traditional boats participating in Damamta Gadukluda, a gathering of native tradition, hosted by the native communities of Kachmak Bay and the Pratt Museum in Homer, paddled in to greet them. Get your paddles ready. Oars up. By doing these projects, we become more in tune with who we are, where we came from. And by understanding more who you are and where you came from, you can go forward and become who you were meant to be. Margaret Nelson. It's very exciting to have the project done. For many years, the circle was incomplete. We were not making kayaks and canoes. God has placed us here for that circle to be complete. I give honor to him and thanks. I also give honor to my ancestors and relatives for the encouragement that they gave me to learn things about my culture and pass it on. June Simeonov, Pardue. Our ancestors had their own wars against poverty and starvation. They traveled to fish camps in the spring, to the mountains in the fall for meat. They lived off the land. Each new generation invented an easier way to do things. Alberta Stefan. The joy I had working on these kayaks cannot be measured. The profit for me has not only been about building kayaks and canoes, but also about building trust and appreciating all the different ways we all have. Gregor Welpton. Well, 
يقسمون الغان لما أكون كا ميقوك توي تلم يوي يكيو مجد تشيو اللي مكتبا يغلو تيني ميقوك كاسكتو ما نبين نبايل بيتا أدور شخيطة قيات مخكن يا غسوت نوم في ثواني نوم نوم غاسو نغان نقا قوان أدور نغد سيئة نركي تما كون يوم يوقع تل تل يقطوي تام كي Uyi yang waktu asam mui, mana elas kami? Ila kau nak ki, aduh kau ki cik kau macam cik dia senyap. VHS copies of this video are available. For information, contact the Alaska Native Heritage Center at 907-330-8000 or visit our website at www.alaskanative.net. Wasn't that fabulous? Thank you so much, Margaret Nelson from the Alaska Native Heritage Center for allowing Heartbeat Alaska to share that beautiful documentary with our viewers. And I'll be back with the Heritage Center right after this. Heartbeat Alaska is brought to you in part by Bristol Environmental and Engineering Services, serving Alaska since 1994, a subsidiary of Bristol Bay Native Corporation. Once she realized that she was definitely going to die, her health went downhill. Even more, I mean, downhill from what? She was lying on the bed. I was holding her. She was breathing like a fish out of water. And the last breath was the same as the one before it. She breathed in, she breathed out, and then she didn't breathe anymore. Hi, I'm Mark from Scan Home, and we are proud to sponsor Heartbeat Alaska. Scan Home, serving all of Alaska's home and office furnishing needs. Thank you, Scan Home, for making Heartbeat Alaska possible. Welcome back. We visit now with the Alaska Native Heritage Center, a fabulous monument here in Anchorage, Alaska, to tradition, the tradition of carrying on what our ancestors have done for thousands of years, and that's to teach one another, teach one another a way of life. Margaret Nelson explains. The Heritage Center exists from the support of people in the communities. The Heritage Center exists for a number of reasons. It's for all Alaskans, and it's for the people to learn about Native cultures. It's for the Native people to share their rich culture. And it's to have fun, and it's to learn things in a fun setting. Here at the Heritage Center, every day we have dance performances, storytellers. We have special exhibits ongoing all the time. Right now we have a special uh, Eskimo doll exhibit on display here that people can come and take a look at. We have more than 40 dolls that were uh, on loan to us that we can share with everyone. We have uh, a hall of cultures that has all sorts of exhibitry in it. We have demonstrating artists so people can come and see the various uh, craft of the different cultures. King Island dancers are very special to the center because they represent uh, the family and one of the native leaders who helped conceive of the idea of the center and had the vision for it to happen. The whole idea of the Heritage Center came from Paul Tialana. Paul Tialana was the founder of the King Island dancers and it is through his vision and the vision of many Alaska native leaders that the Heritage Center came about. What he had learned from his ancestors from King Island, he then handed on to us the songs and dances that, that, that he learned from his grandfathers and his uncles. 
So that's the way we are today, singing and dancing. The reason why he started uh, Eskimo dancing in Anchorage, Alaska, he said he didn't want to lose the rich culture he had, so he brought it back to life here. So that's what encouraged him to be uh, singing here, singing and dancing. I was introduced at a young age, and I was always around it uh, since as long as I can remember, since, I don't know, four. I remember we took a trip up to uh, Fairbanks, and we performed at the um, World Indian Eskimo Olympics. And that was one of my first memories when I was a little kid. And um, just, they stuck through my head all through these years, and I started dancing when I was about 12. some bad feelings and it's just after you start singing and dancing it just it, you're uplifted you know all the weight is lifted off your shoulders and you feel so much better I don't think Eskimo dance is gonna die it's gonna keep on going I'm just surprised at how people enjoy our dancing so much and we touch them you know just through their heart somehow you know, and, and they're a much happier person after our performance, and I just that that makes me on what makes me up on this stage is seeing them other people enjoy, you know, our little performance here. Uh, they just represent the uh, raven mask. Uh, my father made this one, so what did he learn from his ancestors? Then he passed on to us. Uh, this represent the witch doctor. It's about a lady who uh, saw uh, um, a witch doctor up, up, upon a thunder clouds, and she instructed a man to make one. After the man make, made mercy, they performed the dance. This mask is called a witch doctor. This is the one I made. And this is a, a raven mask. This one I made. This is my father made. And this, is, this one is my father's too. So what uh, my father had learned from his grandfather, he passed down to us. I learned how to make masks through my, grand, my, my mother. He's the, she's the one who taught me how to make masks. The other Inupiaq uh, dancers that, uh, that in the groups, that um, some of their instruments, some of their clothing has changed, you know, a little bit modern. I, I think we're more traditional uh, as opposed to like uh, some of the other northern groups. A lot of our, a lot of our uh, regalia is still made from, you know, from the uh, animals around the state and people like it the way we are, so we just keep it the same. Well, the center is more than just a cultural attraction. We're really an educational facility. We have a lot of things going on here that help um, to educate all of us about native cultures. We put in the values and the, the priorities that native people have and so people feel much more comfortable. The other aspect of that is that they also um, are learning from one another how somebody from a different area is doing something and they can incorporate some of those new ideas and designs or different ways of doing things within their own programs. 
And that is really what we're all about. After all, we believe culture is living and we are all interacting and it's a way to grow. I, I think uh, these younger kids here today will be dancing when I'm gone. All, all his equipment, his drums, his eagle feathers, he made, we started using those. So uh, they're uh, very important to us, to the dancers. And the drums that he made, we started using those. They're kind of getting old, but I'll make some later on. We're still using the same skin as he was, as his grandfather was. He passed it on to us. Uh, he taught me how to uh, uh, work on the um, wall stomach before he passed away. So this is a wall stomach. We're still using it today. I don't think it'll change. I don't think it'll change. Thank you so much, Margaret Nelson, and thank you, King Island Dancers. And I'd like to thank you for joining us on Heartbeat Alaska, Native News and Native Information. Hello once again to all our viewers. Hello to our good friends across Canada. Nice to have you with us. Hello, Seminole Tribe. I am so happy to be bringing you Heartbeat Alaska every week. And our good friends on the Navajo Nation. Hello, San Francisco and KCSM TV out of San Mateo. Thank you for airing Heartbeat Alaska. Heartbeat Alaska is aired across America. We've been on the air for over 10 years. And we want to thank you for being loyal, avid viewers. Tell your friends about us, won't you? God bless you. We'll see you again next week. Quanto tá, quanto tá de quanto.